Understanding punching shear is important for any structural engineer, as it's generally the item that governs the design of slabs. It's either that or deflection. So it's important that you have a solid understanding of what punching shear is and the mechanisms behind it. I'll be going through the basics of punching shear, how to design and reinforce for it. This will be a more broad topic, so it'll be more the general topic and not really focus on any code requirements. So I'll be able to apply it no matter where you are in the world. My name is Brendan, a structural engineer based in Australia, and I produce videos around structural engineering and how to progress your career faster. So if you do enjoy that type of content, please subscribe. Now let's get into it. So, what is punching shear? Punching shear is a failure around the concentrated support that's a combination of bending moments and shear forces that create a perimeter conical failure. As the name describes, it's really iconic and if you've seen it before, you'll understand. It looks as though the concentrated force has punched through the slab, hence the name punching shear. This has come from the 1980s where a series of slabs have performed poorly and actually failed. There's quite a lot of research gone around in the 1980s about why this happened and how to reinforce for it. Now the failures occurred around edges of slabs. So there's really two focuses that they either did. It was either focusing around the torsion, as this is really the action that was happening at that point, or around the shear failure. The punching shear is generally initiated by a bending moment. So it generally starts forming the cracks at the top of the slab or the bottom of the slab, depending on whether you've got a point load over or under. And then after the crack is initiated, it'll go 45 degrees back towards that concentrated load. Now, this is not just a failure mechanism for slabs, although it is one of the main drivers of the design. If you do have a really high concentrated load in a wall or other structure, it could potentially be a design mechanism as well. Now, why is it important? Now, this is generally one of the governing features for either slabs and transfer decks. So if we are designing a slab or a transfer deck, there's generally two things you need to start looking for. Do the deflections work in that structure? And does it punch? And these are normally the two governing factors for any design. So it's important that you understand the mechanisms behind it. As we were saying, it is a combination of bending moments. So what you do get is a perimeter around your column. That increased stress can then be resisted in either two ways. You can either have a look at that outer perimeter ring and reinforce for that ring, especially in shear, which is more like ACI and Eurocode. Or you can approach more what they've done in Australia and reinforce the torsion ring. So trying to take that out of balance force out in torsion and then leaving the slab to take the shear component. So there's really two aspects that you could approach this design, each having their both benefits and negatives as well. So what are the benefits and negatives of approaching either a torsion design or a shear design? Well, on the edges of slabs, we do have those big torsions. Those torsion leaks can be quite efficient taking out those out of balance forces. It's only taking that force in tension. Or if you did have to reinforce for shear, it has a lot reduced efficiencies. So you generally need a lot more reinforcement if you are designing for the shear component and the shear force. So where the torsion design actually gets left down is when you have an action that is predominantly in shear. So it's mainly a shear failure, not so much that moment failure. So that out of balance force taken out in torsion doesn't really help you. So the torsion can't not assist you in these situations. So that's where you need to reinforce more for that shear component than the torsion links. So what are some of the key aspects that you need to know when you are designing for a punching shear? As these are things that will potentially trip you up and things you need to focus on that potentially increase the stresses in certain areas. The first one, and something I've actually mentioned at the start, is that punching shear can either occur from a point load over or a point load under. When most engineers are approaching design, they can see the point load under and they have it as a support and they will design for it in those locations. But what's often missed is the fact that a point load over can cause the same action. Because when you think about it, it's just that concentrated force pushing on the structure. So something over the top, if you've got a piece of paper, you can punch through it. So it's the same design as well. So whether it's over or under, punching shear can occur. The one area we may get tripped up is looking at the average depth. As there will be a tension phase, you need to apply additional reinforcement at that tension phase, especially for that shear truss. So you just need to look at to make sure that you've got the correct depth in your design. So if you've got a punching under, you're checking the top cover. Or if you've got a punching forth over from that concentrated point load over, 
you're taking that bottom section. Just something to be careful of when you are doing these type of designs. Another area potentially that also trips people up is set downs. Now where set downs trip you up is they generally take the deeper section or the smaller section. This can lead to an either conservative design or unconservative design depending on which way you approach it. So how does the set down affect you? Well, it actually affects the depth of your room right? and there's really two ways you can do to look at this. You can have a look at either taking the average perimeter, so if your bending moment is going in one direction, so if we're saying across the page in this section, then you can see you can take the average, as it's really the average of that punching shear perimeter that's going to be critical. But if the moment's going the other direction, that may be an unconservative approach, as if the moment's going towards the shallower section, you should actually be taking the lower depth, as that is going to be the critical plane in your design. So when you are looking at the design, potentially on what direction you're looking at it with that moments and bending, you may need to take to actually a different or reduced depth. Now this is quite common on residential structures, especially we have set downs for bathrooms. So it's something to be careful of when you are designing these areas. Penetrations are also another area which can trip people up quite a lot. As penetrations essentially break the integrity of the slab around there, it stops the slab from being continuous and puts that, stops that pushback the back effect. Another thing is when you are looking at drawing your perimeters, especially for punching shear, it says something that intersects with your punching shear perimeter. So if you're trying to draw the shortest punching shear perimeter possible, sometimes you will intersect those voids and they can be seated inconsistencies in your design. So essentially you're reducing your punching shear perimeter. And when you are looking at that, you just need to look at where the flow of forces are going. So which way are they coming into your structure to make sure you have reinforced for it correctly. Because as you can see here, the, with the penetration at the top, you cannot get pen force in that direction. So if you're trying to take moment down the other direction, you may need to apply additional moments in that section or have additional shear heads wherever you need to. Similar to penetrations, edge and corner columns have a reduced punching shear perimeter. As when that punching shear perimeter intersects with the edge of a slab, it essentially drops off to zero. So it's about drawing those shortest punching shear perimeters. Now you do have reduced loads here, but you do also have increased moments from the columns. As when you have edge columns, there's increased moments from those torsion locations. And this is where the original failures were occurring in the 1980s. So this is really where you should try and focus your design checks on, as they have that both shear and bending moment in those locations. And similar, if you have a column slightly set back, you can potentially have a punching shear perimeter that is still intersecting with the edge of the slab. And the punching shear perimeter will essentially go to the shortest distance possible. So if your shortest distance is intersecting with the edge of the slab, that will be your critical design perimeter. So it's just something to look out for. Benefit, especially when designing slabs and post-tensioning, is that post-tensioning actually helps you as it helps clamp that mechanism and it gives you an enhanced shear stress in these locations. However, areas where you can get tripped up on is edge and corners of slabs. As we said in the post tensioning design, which I'll also link down below, edges of slabs don't have as much PT as you think they do. As where you have those live and dead ends, there's a zone of uncompressed area, which you need to reinforce to make sure you get that minimum reinforcement. This is also the same when you're designing for punching shear. So if you have an edge column and you have post tensioning, so say left to right in this picture, there'll be zero pre-compression force in that zone. So it actually doesn't help you in this situation. The only place that would help you is up and down the page, obviously, because you don't have those local supports that are stopping you from those pre-compression forces. But a lot of people potentially will pick up the left or right, which is actually incorrect due to these zones of non-compression force. So when you are designing it, just making sure you're assessing the directions that you're looking for your pre-compression. What actually makes it worse if you do have a corner column similar to the edge column, but now you've got two directions. So potentially you have no PT in either direction at this point. So you don't have that additional benefit of that post tensioning for that corner column. Congestion is a key factor in any design, especially for RC concrete. And this is even more critical when you're designing for punching shear. Generally, especially when you're designing slabs, it's actually recommended to design the slab such that it doesn't need that punching shear reinforcement, especially for transfer decks. So if you are designing a transfer deck, first pass, try and design it so it doesn't need any punching shear reinforcement in first state. Because if you do need that punching shear reinforcement, you're increasing the chances potentially that you have deflection problems in your slab, so you potentially need a lot more reinforcement or a lot of PT, which also increases that risk of congestion as well and causing that honeycombing. 
Another area which is also critical is when you're designing these areas, especially in heavily reinforced areas, they like to cast pipes inside structures. So if you've got big pipes and they're going inside your structure down your column, that is going through your shear interface, which actually reduces your punchy shear capacity. So it's just something to look out for. If you do have big pipes in there, potentially similar to penetrations going through your slab, you may actually have a reduced perimeter through that pipe penetrating your punching shear perimeter precast columns. There's actually two ways you can do these precast columns. There's one way where they stop, start the precast column over and just have the reinforcing bars go through. So it allows you to pull the slab all the way through. Now this is really good for our punching design as we can design as per normal. However, there's another way where they're actually casting a notch in your precast panel. And they prefer to do it this way as it allows them to have less reinforcement. They don't need to have that reinforcement to join it together. However, this creates another failure plane. Essentially, they have a shear interface, as you can see here, dotted in red. That shear interface will fail first, and then after that, potentially it's dropped down. So you don't need to design for that punching shear. So there's actually two checks you need to do on these PC columns. Is doing that first, that interface that I can see here, then move out to doing your punching shear design. So in these locations, just something to be careful, especially around detailing in these areas. So as I mentioned, there's really two ways to try and reinforce the report of this. You can either go down the Australian standards and there's even some guidance in ACI about designing for those torsions. So you're designing the torsions and taking out those out of balance forces in torsion. However, this causes a number of problems. Firstly, are you actually governed by torsion or shear, which you do need to be careful about. And also if you are designing reinforced concrete or post tension concrete, Builders generally don't like it as it essentially messes up the way they want to design. They don't like having those closed legs inside your structure, especially for post tension design. So it's normally what they push is going down the stud rail situation. And that is reinforcing for the shear location. So you just need to be careful about the codes you're using. Most codes around the world, especially Eurocode and ACI, do have covering for this. So I'm sure you are able to cover this quite easily. But here in Australia, we only really do that torsion design. And so it's not actually just picking up your torsion design and using the same reinforcement inside there, as you actually undercook that design in that situation. So if you are designing, especially in Australia, you should need to pick up either Eurocode or ACI and design it to that. What you'll find though, when you do design for that, you'll have a lot more reinforcement than you're expecting due to the inefficiencies of those headed shear studs. As they have reduced studs, as they are just reinforcing for the shear, it's actually reduced capacity in them. So you actually need quite a lot more than if you're actually designing for those torsion legs. So it's actually looking into that detail and making sure you understand it and not just cherry picking. So if you are picking up a different code, especially an international code, it's making sure you read the whole code to make sure you don't get tripped up by missing out on clauses early in the code that may actually be reliant on what you're designing here. So as you can see here, now I've got a couple of examples onto the screen of a punching shear design, especially for those stud rails. And you can see here we've served excessive rings as we go out. As you can see, we jump further and further out. We have bigger and bigger rings as we, as we go out and throughout our structure. Now, as these rings go further and further out, we need to make sure that we're rechecking it because as per Eurocode or ACI, you need to check out each ring until you get to a point where the concrete is able to withstand it in the RC form without this reinforcement in it. So it's just something to be careful of when you are looking at it is making sure you are designing those excessive rings as you go out. There's another couple of ways as well you can address this and this is more about geometry and slab design. So you can either do a drop panel, so by locally thickening at a column, you can drop down the depth of your slab. So essentially increasing the depth of your punching shear, essentially allowing you to reinforce that concrete in just the RC concrete. So you don't need that reinforcement through that joint. So increasing the depth increases the depth plane that you've got the stress over. So it allows you to design it out of just normal concrete. You just do need to be careful about a little bit of detailing where your reinforcement's going. But this is definitely a way, if you've got the depth requirement, there's an easy way to do it. Alternatively, if you can inside, increase the size of your column, obviously by increasing the size of your column, you're increasing your punching shear perimeter, which also helps you out as well. There are just a couple of ways that if you do have the geometry that is not a constraint, is looking at doing it this way. So by either doing drop panels, increasing the size of your slab, or just increasing your column structures. So I hope this has helped you understand punching shear a bit more in detail. It is critical when you're doing slab designs or transfer decks, as it will generally govern those designs a lot of the time. And if you do need me covering a little more detail, give some work examples, please comment below. I'm always happy to help out. And if you have made it to this point, 
Please hit that like button, helps get it out to more people, but helps share the knowledge that I've produced here today. Anyway, I look forward to seeing you next week. Bye.